Hello and welcome to the show. Now, if you've been following this series, you know this is all about inspirational people in our community. Today, we have none other than Norman J. MBE. Nice to meet you, sir. Good to meet you. I call him sir. He's known as Sir Norman, but yes. Yeah. It's been a while to nail you down. So yeah. busy. But after all of that, happy to be here. Real pleasure. We're great, 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 great to have you. We haven't seen each other, haven't spoken since... For a long time. For a long time. <laughs> a long time. Yeah. So how are you? How are you and yourself? Um, overworked and overpaid. <laughs> uh, Few can say that. But, no, in all seriousness, though, yeah, I've managed to um, kind of uh, generate this work-life balance. So I really love my work, but I have a lot of time away from my work. You know, home time, family okay. time. And uh, the balance is working at the moment. Right. But who knows, if the scales may tip as we get closer towards the busy period in summer. Because I'm just seeing flyers and everything all over the place with Norman J, MPE, this event, that event. I mean, how do you find the time or the energy? Uh, yeah. um, the energy isn't a problem okay. um, because I've never uh, self-abused. I'm a lifelong teetotaler, never drank, don't do drugs, eat really healthily. You know, I'm not a vegetarian or vegan like my son, but, you know, my wife Jane is a really great cook and always uses fresh produce. And because of the hours that I keep when I'm traveling up and down Britain's motorways in the twilight hours or having to fly across to Europe to, to do a gig or an event, um, the one thing I do, I, I eat well. Yeah. Yeah, and when I get the time to sleep, I maximize Well, that's the important sleep. thing. Yeah. Food is either poison or yeah. medicine. <laughs> You yeah, know, well, for me, it's fuel. Yeah, <laughs> well, fuel, <laughs> yeah, poison, or medicine. Or, or yeah. medicine. And, sure, yeah. You know, you need to really eat the right things, especially when you have yeah. a busy schedule. Sure. So mm. you are a West London boy, you yeah. were telling me yeah. originally. And you grew up where? Grew up, I was born in Ludbrook Grove. Um, grew up in Acton, two miles away. Um, an Acton boy, essentially, but because all my friends and family remained in the hood, in the grove, in Notting Hill, that's where I spent a lot of my formative years. Um, and lived in Brixton for how many years? Can't remember. Lived in Brixton, south of the river for a long time, and then moved even further south a few years ago. But always in and around London. I'm a London boy, born and bred. West London boy. I'm fiercely proud of London um, for all the good things and all the bad things. Well, that's it. Wherever yeah. you go, they're yeah. good and bad. Yeah. Yeah. Wherever you go. Absolutely. You just have to strike yeah. the balance. Mm. So how was your school life? My school life, um, I didn't really enjoy school, if I'm really honest. Um, well, that's what we want, honestly. I was just one of those kids that kind of drifted through. I wasn't brilliant, but, you know, I wasn't, you know, a troublesome kid. You know, right. I tried, I learned very quickly to try and remain um, invisible by not upsetting anybody. <laughs> you know, hide in the middle, never up there, never down there. But you know, outside of the school, um, my school situation, um, I was a very adventurous kid. I... I strove for adventure, right. um, made friends easily, um, and I had a yearning for, uh, for traveling. Um, being, being a young kid who was very inquisitive, uh, it's funny because I look back at my school days now and I realize that um, most of the, the teachers that attempted to teach me didn't engage me. Yet, um, outside of the school environment, my head was like a sponge. Right. I, took, I took everything in around me using all my, all my senses. You know, my sight, what I saw, I never forgot. You know, what I heard, what I smelt, what I tasted. You know, all my senses were heightened because um, luckily my parents, looking back um, as West Indian migrants, were pretty liberal. Right. When I think to... Um, that post-Windrush generation of parents, how strict they were with, 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 their, with their offspring. Um, 
my mum and dad were, were pretty brilliant. liberal. Very liberal. Yeah. By those sort of West Indian standards. Um, yeah. And occasionally I might transgress and be shown that that's not something I should be doing. Be doing. <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah my, my parents are great, always encouraging. You know, I'm the second of six. Um, I was going to get to that yeah, now. How many siblings? Yeah, sadly, I, I lost you know, a middle brother and a middle sister only in the last 15 months. Um, quite unexpected and quite a shock. Uh, but having said that, you know, I come from a close family. Um, yeah, and you're yeah. the youngest? Uh, no, I'm not no, the youngest. No, I'm the second. Second. Yeah, I'm an older sister. Um, but yeah, unlike other sort of families um, that I was aware of at the time anyway, my mum and dad were great. I mean, even now, um, and you probably encountered my dad. He still came to my first gigs. He still comes to my gigs now, nearly 50 years later. Yeah. He still shows up at uh, London venues where the, the old doorman, they know him, they let him in, they encourage him to come in. You know. That's fantastic. Well, That's dad's, real support. Yeah, and, and, and having an interest. Even when, before I was playing in London clubs, when I was running illegal house parties, illegal warehouse parties, my dad was always there. Wow. He always came, whether he ran and the And it door. makes all the difference. Oh, it made all the difference, you know, um, because he understood that unlike other peers or contemporaries of mine at the time, I could have been selling drugs, I could have been into crime, getting into trouble with the police. Fortunately, thankfully, um, I never went down that route. I mean, for most... But you see, your parents, they could actually see that, you know what, he's a good boy. Well, yes, I, I he wasn't... Runs, no, I, runs the parties, but... Sure, but... Um, I, how can I say, you know, I wasn't a church kid because I hated religion, still do, but that's an entirely another subject. Um, but uh, they were encouraging in the positive things that I aspired to do. Right. Yeah, I think that's the best way to put it. Yeah. I mean, they could see, well, yes, he runs the parties, but he's not a drinker, he's not into <laughs> drugs. He's a, he's a good boy, he just wants to be out well, with well, his he, friends. Even as a schoolboy, you know, I was trusted. Yeah. Um, I was about eight or nine, and my dad gave me a 10 shilling note, which used to be as big as this. Do you even days. know that money? I mean, <laughs> 50p <laughs> to today. And it was like a bed sheet, I would trust have been, me. Yeah, this would have been mid-60s, because, you know, I'm in my 61st year. So, yeah, I would have been about Look eight. at this guy. Please close up. 61st year, and can say it proudly. You yeah. see? That is yeah. clean living. Yeah. Um, Back to the ten shilling. Note. Yeah, and you know, I was trusted to get the bus, you know, on my own and do a three mile bus ride from my mum and dad's house in Acton to Shepherd's Bush Market and go and buy the family's Christmas records. And I can't remember how many, I think I only bought one or two records with the money that I had then. Um, and then the very next week my dad gave me even more money to go back and, and buy even more. Because you proved yourself. Yeah, and, and that thus begun my record collecting. Which my As dad- was eight. Yeah, right. I was yeah, eight or nine. I, I was not quite nine, because I've been discussing, I've had these discussions with my dad over the years to, to pinpoint you know, these pivotal moments in my life. Right. And my dad said, yeah, you're about eight or nine. I totally understand that because the first record I ever bought was Family Affair. Right. Which is 1971. Yeah. And I think I was... My dad bought that in 71. Six or seven at the yeah, time. Yeah. I used to just be locked to Radio 1 because yeah. that's all yeah, he yeah. had at the time. Yeah, and, yeah. you know, had yeah. to buy this record. Yeah. This money going by the record. Well, we, we, we probably share. I, I totally get that. Similar experiences, yeah. Um, what was your first job? My first job, I was a, an apprenticed um, litho printer. Um, yeah, it wasn't a job that I enjoyed, mm. but I had to do it because I had to, for me, work was something that you did for a reason. And my reason was because I had a, a vinyl habit. I was gonna say. I had a clothes habit, yeah. a football habit, and a traveling habit. 
which at 11 pounds a week on my first job didn't fund very much didn't, didn't go very far yeah. especially after I'd paid my five pounds board and rent um, which really sort of made you feel like an adult it's that transition from being a kid to a man when you're able to come home with your first week's wage packet that was a really proud moment I remember and going here mum this is for you this is for all the support this you know yeah. this is for taking care of us and yeah and that's that's how it began but um I did that for a couple of years um didn't really like it um but what I didn't want to do was to be unemployed um because jobs weren't that um easy to come by easy to come by in those days especially mm. if you were <laughs> if you were black a person of color you know and then so one wouldn't give up a you know relatively good job easily and what kind of um, years are we talking about here i'm talking about um 1974 i left school easter 1974 and walked straight into a job after mm. the weekend in those days you kind of you could have <laughs> <laughs> um And I stuck it until the spring of 1976. Well, um, that's two years. Yeah, yeah but um, I didn't really want to, you know, I was in a job because I was in a job, not really knowing what I wanted to do. Right. Um, but better you be in a job. In a job than yeah. unemployed. <laughs> yeah. And especially when you've got all of those expensive habits yeah, that need oh, to be yeah, funded. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but by the spring of 1976, um, I was unemployed, first time ever. Um, didn't really want to sign on. Uh, it was desperate times, but I signed on, got a gyro. For the, so for the whole of that summer, I didn't work. But even now, looking back on it, that was still the best summer that I ever had. Right. <laughs> uh, the summer of 1976 saw, on the negative side, um, the Notting Hill Carnival, first big riot at Notting Hill Carnival. Wow, that was 1976? Yeah. yeah. Um, it was the hottest summer on record up until um, that year. Uh, and I remember vividly because the, the summer was so hot and most of us had afros then, that summer. <laughs> yeah. And because of the excessive heat, there was an explosion of ladybirds. Don't know if you remember that. Ooh. So all, a lot of black boys, especially those with afros, black girls, or people with locks, their hair would become infested with ladybirds. If you look it Brilliant. Up, I've yeah. never heard this history. Yeah, yeah, no, but, but it's true. Yeah, that's, it's true. Yeah. So I think they sold more afro pics that summer. <laughs> because oh, that's spent, what it was all about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, apart from coming, <laughs> but the, the pics were great for, remo yeah, for, for, removing, them. for removing the ladybirds. Yeah, there was, yeah, August Bank Holiday 1976. Uh, the first big serious riot. Notting Hill burned for yes, two I, nights. Yes, I do remember. Then. Um, and the most fantastic records came out that year. And for me, he was a record buyer, fanatical record buyer, or as much as funds would allow then, a serial party goer. Um, 1976 saw the advent of the first 12-inch records. Um, and I refused to buy them when they were advertised um, at first because they were just too expensive. You know, same size as an LP. Yeah, with only <laughs> one track. With only one track, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Um, but then a couple of records came out um, which made me have to reconsider. Relent. <laughs> yeah, I had to relent um, because I loved them. And one of those records was Double Exposures, 10%. Um, the other one was um, Young Hearts Run Free. Can you see? Again, is that? Yeah. yeah. Um, and then I just went mad after that. It was out of control. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? I had to. I had to find a job very quickly because I had to have all of these records. And what was your second job then? Uh, Where did you go from there? From there, um, I went back into the print. I managed to find myself a job at a small printer. But again, I went back and got a job because at this time um, I needed to fund my first trip to America. 
Okay. That's the main reason why I, I've got a job. Um, 1977, my first son, Mark, was born. So I have to get a job. I've got a child to support now from my then partner. Um, and that time, my parents were seriously considering moving to America. Okay. Um, because um, all my father's large extended family were living there, telling him he should come. He should go, yeah. Give up his job here. And my mum was absolutely adamant she wasn't going. Because right. my mum's family were here. My younger brothers and sisters were at school. Got more chances to It would have been having to uproot all yeah, of that. Yeah, and my mum wasn't having any of it. Yeah. So the compromise was, well, as you're the oldest boy, you go and see if you like it. Right. So in order to do that, I had to get a job. <laughs> so I got a job back in the printers, saved up for about a year. And then in the spring of 1979, I got on a Freddie Laker jet and I go to New York for the first time. And that was absolutely life-changing. Now I bet that's when the record buying really went crazy. <laughs> yeah, the record buying really went crazy um, then, because on that first trip, I was met at JFK by my dad's younger brother. Um, and I was in absolute awe of the place. It was everything, every film you'd ever seen, ever seen. everything you'd ever seen on the telly, every magazine, <laughs> photograph you'd ever seen and suddenly I've arrived in the Big Apple. Um, I have to remember disco was just peaking and that was the summer of 79 in New York was one of the hottest summers. I think everywhere the planet was going a bit mad because England had had a heat wave. The, 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 hot, the, hot, the hottest summer in a hundred years then and New York was going through a similar thing and I spent three months the, the entire summer yeah. Um, the most, I had the most amazing time. I bought records, I went clubbing. Um, and because I was 21, 22, old enough, um, and aware, the most important thing, I was aware of what I, I was experiencing, what I was discovering. Um, you know, I wasn't just a kid, you know, who was caught in the headlights. You know, I, I had a handle on club culture, I had an interest in it. Right. Um, so I went, I used to stand outside Studio 54 across the road, watching all of these people turning up and going in, thinking to myself, this is shit. <laughs> I, I really used to think that. Um, and it's then I understood, that was my first taste and experience of celebrity culture. That was yeah. the first time I'd ever seen a rope outside a club. Go, yeah. And you had to stand the other side of the rope. You know, I'm seeing this in 1979, and we weren't to see this until about 1989 in London. All right. Um, so I see all this, and I'm standing there with my cousin going, uh, because back in England, you know, I used to go to Crackers in London. I used to go to the Blackpool Mecca, you know, in Blackpool. I used to go to Wigan Casino. Completely different, differing facets of yes. club culture in the UK. Yeah. Um, and they were all, all different. And I was into all of it, to be, to be really honest. I was into all of it. Well, that yeah. is about, that is yeah. your eclectic mix of yeah. what you play, how you play, and but, but how I, you draw I, I, under, so I understood it, in. but when I went to America, I realized it was completely different. Because I, I, I go to New York, I go to my first 100% black gay club that I'd never been to in England before. And... I experienced the music on a completely different I was going to say, level. I bet the music was fantastic, though. The music was fantastic. It was all new, you know. Um, and, it, you know, I went to... Uh, well, perhaps not in those early days, because I, I quickly realised anywhere I wanted to go to, you had to show ID. Mm. You had to be over 21. Because I looked so young, you know, I was 21, I was 22. So I had to go there with... a with, with my passport, prove, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and so a lot of my family and cousins who were like six foot tall, big, wide, they're only teens, yeah. so they can't go to these places that I wanted my cousins to take me to, yeah. you know, because I didn't know anybody, so that was a little bit frustrating, but what was great was um, I was a big fan of the radio, 
When I turned on black radio in New York, I was like, wow. Yeah, what is going on? So I'm listening to WBLS. I'm listening to, uh, I can't remember, so many stations with so many of um, the producers of black music we all know and love. These guys had shows on the radio. Yeah. When at this time, back in England, all we had was Greg Edwards on Capital on a Saturday night. That's all we got. With his bathroom call. But, yeah, remember which that? is great. I'm not yeah. knocking that. But when you go to somewhere like, and I'm only talking about New York. You know, as I had family, you know, most of my family was in New York and I had some family in, in New Jersey. Um, but at that time, at that early on, that trip, I didn't get across to New Jersey. Um, but, you know, I'm in New York. Uh, go to South Bronx because my family where I stayed was in Crown Heights. And then when I get there, I walk into my aunt's house, Crown Heights, then the penny drops. Ah, this is where Crown Heights Affair come from. <laughs> and suddenly all of these areas and street names that you... The really, strings started to come together. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> wow. So, so Crown Heights Affair record just around the corner. Um, and on that trip, that first trip was, was amazing. I still remember... The exchange rate then was two, $2.64 $2. 60, to the pound. I'm like, wow. I'm like a dollar millionaire. Yeah. You know, so um, records were really cheap. And I remember the, the one thing, on the first trip, I went to this big record shop downtown in Brooklyn um, called The Wiz. It was like an hour price because there was Wiz. You yeah, know, on, on, I know on that, The Wiz. Called, called The Wiz. And my aunt used to work full time in a in a big department store, which was next to it. Abraham Strauss. It was like Harrods. Oh, God. Yeah, my my aunt worked there. You're a bringing lot of my back family memories. You're yeah, bringing back Strauss. memories. And I used to go in the morning with my aunt. She'd go to work. I go to the record shop. And they used to, all my aunts and uncles used to tease me about all the records that I was buying because in those days, uh, after that first trip, I learned I got hit. Badly, when I came back, um, you had to pay a duty. Yeah. On this. So I quickly learned that the next time when I went out there next year, because I went out there for about five, six years on the trot, every year I'd go subsequent years. Um, and then the next year I went, I went in the, at that time, probably the only record and tape that existed, because the very first record and tape shop opened in Gold Oak Road. Right five minutes from my house on a bike. <laughs> and I used to be down there in the basement when no black people used to go in there. And I knew the guys, all the punk guys that, that worked upstairs. This guy, yeah, go down on fire. Yeah, you've got a big punk connection, haven't you? Uh, yeah. So uh, that second year I went back, this would have been 1980, I went with a big paper round bag full of old crap rock records and signed a declaration form when I left. So when I came back, as far as... The uh, customs were, so you went and you left with those records. With those, right. They never used to check. Sometimes, occasionally, they would check. I mean, they, I can't remember, sometime in the mid 80s, they changed that rule, but for a long time, you couldn't bring back records or, or stuff. Um, but yeah, that, that was one of the, the things. And, and I remember coming back, well, going back to my first trip. When I got back, I said to my mum, I loved it and I hated it with equal measure. I would never move and live there yeah. because I saw in 1979 um, there was guards on the kids school I couldn't comprehend that there was yeah. you know um, serious crime going on in, in the black neighborhoods there this is in 1979 and I was quite dismissive of that going that would never happen in England and I remember on my first trip was the first time I'd stayed in a black ghetto, an all-black area, which really threw me. Yeah. I just couldn't get my head around that. And, you know, my cousin was telling me, no, you don't walk past this block. You don't walk past there, 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 because of all the Italians live there, all the Irish live there, all the Jews live there, and you don't cross. Cross. Because I remember yeah. there was a murder in, on, on TV, you know, um, Two black boys were kicked, beaten to death in Bensonhurst, which is like a couple of miles away from where my aunts live in, in broad daylight. Three, four or five Italians beat these guys, shot them, did, did everything to them in broad daylight. A murder going on. There's almost like another race war was going to kick off. And that's how I remember being acutely aware of the racial divide 
Blacks yeah. are here. <laughs> Hispanics you know, I think there. most of us have that same experience yeah. because our but families... I didn't, I, but I didn't know that in England. Yeah. This, is what, this is what I'm trying we, to say. Our I families yeah. either came to England, went yeah. to the States or went to Canada. So yeah, you yeah. always had that connection where you could yeah, go yeah. from one to the other. Yeah, yeah. And I remember when my mother's brother went, yeah. he'd obviously come to England first, yeah. left to go to live in New York, got his yeah. job in a bank or whatever yeah. it was. And... You know, as you say, at that time, it mm. was all, well, come over because there's so many opportunities here. Yeah, yeah. Let's go over. He went over and my mother was saying, oh, yes, I'll come. And he said, absolutely not. Mm. He said, you can come and visit with the boys anytime you want to, mm. but this is no place to raise your children. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 I came back with, with that as well. Yeah. I thought, absolutely no way. And I, as you I, say, I, so I, I loved it and I, I loved it and I hated it in equal measure. Yeah. I was fascinated by it. I remember I had migraine for about for every day, <laughs> virtually for about the first three weeks I was there. I couldn't get my head around this 24-hour non-stop culture. Sirens all day, sirens yeah. all night, and it was it so never hot. Stopped. It so never people stopped. didn't go to yeah. bed all three, four o'clock in the morning. Everyone's on their stoop, music playing. It's so it's stinking hot. In those days, you know, it was great because you could just go to the end of the block, you turn on the fire hydrant. Yeah. And then after a couple of years, they made that illegal. So you couldn't switch on the fire. I remember you used to see the kids playing yeah, I, in the I, fire I, Yeah, hydrants. I remember at the end of my aunt's road. Yeah. And that fire hydrant used to be on most of the day. It yeah. was just everything I'd ever seen and read and heard and, and loved and feared about America was there. But ultimately, I knew I couldn't stay there and live there because my personal upbringing in England, I grew up with white kids. I grew up with Asian, Asian kids. Asians, that's yeah, right. That they're still my friends now. You know, yes. um, we, we never had, had that, that separate. Di- no. And, separated, and at that time, yeah. you know, America, I was always scared of America anyway. Um, I'd never traveled outside of the state of New York. Um, and even in subsequent years, when I did travel outside of New York, I just thought, thank goodness I'm, I'm English. I really think that. Thank goodness I'm I think you hit the nail on the head, though, when you said you loved it and hated it in equal measure. Yeah. And it is, the things you love are about the music and there's a certain kind of vibe and attitude. But yet, the bit that you don't like is by far outweighs that. Of course, yeah, absolutely. That sense of safety and security that you have here. You just don't seem to have it there. I mean, my aunt... And my uncle used to have bars on their windows. Yeah, yeah. and that was back then. I yeah, mean, you, you didn't go see past, that here until past, much later. You go past the school. You know, I said to my cousin Wayne, "Who's that? Is that a police officer?" Yeah, it's a police officer. Escorting the kids in and waiting outside at night. Yeah. And I'm like, unheard of. Unheard of for yeah. me. And, it, and it's a real sad indictment of society that, you know, 25 years on. We have this in England. If you'd have said that to me 25, 30 years ago, you have your mind. We're not like that in England. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And conversely, now, with, through the actions of various mayors in New York, New York is really cleaned up, really sanitized, really safe. And London has gone the other <laughs> way. Gone the other way. Yeah. You know, it's still safe if you know, but. It, you still have to be careful. But they were actually saying, there was a report, I think two weeks ago, mm. saying that the murders in London mm. are now starting to surpass yeah. those Yeah, I, in I New heard York. that as well. I heard that as well. But that was my, my trip to New York. Mm. Uh, I, I loved it. Um, um, and I, I came back reinvigorated. I mean, when, before I went, New York to me was like, was like a mecca, somewhere I always aspired yeah. to go but couldn't afford to. And then when the opportunity did come, I was very scared about going. But then I went. Um, it met all my expectations and more. And I came back um, renewed, um, inspired, and thought after all the clubs I went to out there, and it's mainly um, my uncle, Leo, uh, my dad's youngest brother, was, he's only a few years older than me. You know, he was a major um, impact on me. Um, because I didn't realize that he ran a sound system as well. Okay. In Flatbush, he had a club called the Flamingo. It was the largest and most popular Caribbean social club and soca club in New York at the time. Right. My uncle was running it. That was his club. And as a consequence of that, my uncle 
uh, my uncle Leo was in the US DJ pool. I never knew all of this until I went around his house. He was in the DJ pool, which meant he used to get sent promos from all the major labels of all the stuff that he never really used the club stuff because his interest was Soka and the Calypso. Right. And the, and so somehow they found their way into your bag and back to yeah, London. Yeah, so, <laughs> no, so he won, I think it was the 1980 trip, my second or third trip. When I, I, I never used to go to the Flamingo because, you know, everyone that went, it was very West Indian. And I was such an Anglophile, you know, I wasn't interested to this day. I'm still really not interested in Calypso or, or any of that music. So I wouldn't go there. Um, right. Uh, I think, and he used to host private functions there as well, you know, weddings, christenings. So one afternoon I was persuaded to go down there for a, a christening or something, and I was absolutely shocked. The size of the club in the basement was about four or five times the size of this, with a sound system to die for. I'm like, whoa, I've never, never knew all of this. And then when he showed me in his record room, he said, nephew, go and take what you want. <laughs> Died and gone to heaven. Yeah. But most of the stuff he had, I looked through, I already owned, uh, I already right. had. Yeah. So I just filled in all the blanks, all the stuff, the stuff that, that you didn't, didn't have. Know, didn't. I didn't, yeah. yeah. And, and um, yeah, he just boxed them up. And so you had happen. two jobs in printing. Yeah. When did you finally decide, this is not for me anymore, music is my uh, direction? When I was made redundant from my print job. I used to manage a print shop in Denman Street in 1982. Um, yeah, right behind Piccadilly Tube Station. I managed a print shop there for a few years. So, and in my time there, I got to know all the local Soho people because Soho was like my second home. You know, I used to go to after hours, speakeasies there. And because I worked there in the day, I knew quite a lot of the the um, shop managers that worked in all the clothes shops. I knew some of the night girls that would play their trade behind the theatre. Um, yeah, I was a Soho face because I, I worked there. Yeah. Um, and I was always in um, Berwick Street Market because I knew quite a lot of the traders. Some of my mates used to be traders in Berwick Street in the 80s. And I was always in and out of a shop called um, Cheapo Cheapo. Oh, uh, because my cheaper cheapers was <laughs> just mate, Mark, the ultimate. You remember the stall that used to be outside the shop on Correct. weekends? Well, my mate Mark, my punky mate from Brixton, he used that was his stall. He used to run it. I used to so, live in that shop. <laughs> cheaper cheapers. Yeah, yeah. Even though the old boy downstairs are misery guts, but yeah, uh, I, I knew Mark. Was that, don't you want us to buy your records? You no, always seem angry. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, his personality trait. Yeah. But strangely, he was always all right to me. Yeah. I think it's because he knew that I, I knew Mark. Mark, right. was, Mark was the punk guy who used to sell all the records outside. And he used to sell all the 45s. That's it. And the stuff he used to get was incredible. And the I was to get first dibs because I'd meet him for lunch because I just walked, worked around the corner. Yeah. See him every day. I go, Mark, what you got? What's coming? What's the record companies give you? Because yeah, I can remember Daddy Cool was yeah, yeah. on the other side That's of right. the arch yeah, 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 yeah. in Berwick Street. And That's you'd it. walk, either, either whichever yeah. way you were walking, you'd either get to Daddy well, Cool's first and then Chief well, or Chief or vice versa. My brother lived in Daddy Cool's and I lived in Chief. So, <laughs> yeah, Jerry lived in there. So, you know, Soho was, was virtually my second home. Right. I loved Soho, but it's strange, you know, the relationship you build up with it because I, to this day, I still never really enjoyed or, or liked any club. That was in Mayfair, just across the road, just crossing Regent Street was a different vibe. I yeah. never took to any of the clubs, whether it was Monk Breeze or... I was uh, going to say, I, that I, was I, legendary, I, I, come I, on. I never Monk. liked Mayfair clubs, no, I just... Monk Breeze was no. legendary. <laughs> well, <laughs> it, it was and it wasn't. Mm -hmm. um, Soho clubs have left a lasting legacy that everyone relates to. Even before the black soul boy clubs, you know, even around the corner from where I used to work, um, there was a famous mod club that stood, there. I'm trying to think of the name of it, um, the Flamingo. You know, in the late 50s, early 60s, it was the mod place. Right. And even my dad went there to see live acts. And I, right. I was shocked when my dad told me, yeah, the Flamingo, I used to go there. I'm like, what? <laughs> you? <laughs> uh, it's amazing um, but th th these were the places where um, 
little dives that were cool Soho spots, late yeah. 50s, early 60s. Yeah. Um, they kind of trickled on through yeah, to the and, 70s. Yeah, and, and even through, you know, even when the swing in 60s was happening, you know, there used to be little places in and around Carnaby Street. You know, that's all Soho. That's right, yeah. yeah. That's true. You know, whether it's Those the, the, the Marquee. Those were the clubs, you know. They yeah, were, whether really. it's the Marquee or a 100 Club. Well, oh. 100 Club's technically not Soho, but... You know, it kind of is. It kind of is. It kind of is. Kind of is. Yeah. And crackers, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing times because talking of 100 Club, just in recent weeks, um, a friend of mine has just tipped me off that there is footage of me in the 100 Club dancing in 1975. Really? Yeah. And I've seen that footage and I remember the night and it was... Amazing! I didn't even know this thing existed, um, and I just saw it for the Can first time a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah, it would have been um, Ronnie L, Ronnie Lando, who was the manager then. This is pre Greg Edwards, right? Yeah, um, Greg wasn't to come there uh, for a few months, but at that time, it was definitely Ronnie who was playing. And then personally, you know, I, uh, Ronnie's taste was much more to my taste. Okay. Yeah, Greg was. More populist, and maybe I was young and just a bit more extreme, and a bit more underground. Because for me, those yeah. days, it was definitely crackers. Yeah. And I used but to love Hunter before, Club. I'm talking Hunter Club predates crackers. This is before right. crackers. Right. When that, when Hunter Club began to get a little bit tired of the, the music, and was not really happening. Um, it was the Tuesday, Tuesday nights. I'm sure it was. Yeah, it was Tuesday night at Crackers when Mark Roman was, was playing. And we were down there with friends of mine on the opening night when he first came there. And, and the reason why I know that is because that before he came there, the club was struggling, it was empty, and it was being refurbished. And my mate's dad, my mate Colin's dad, was the chippy that refurbished it. He was working there. And then one night he came back. We're all hanging out on the street, bored around Colin's house. And he'd just come home from work. Got his tickets for a club. You look like West End, don't you? Was his words. And he gave us all the ticket. This club, they got this thing going. They're opening it on a Tuesday. And these are free tickets. Go down there. Said, oh, West End on a Tuesday. We got work. But we all went. And there was hardly anybody in there except a few freebie ticket holders. But I'm sure you've been in that position. Mm. You know when something is going to take going off. To the music hot. was so yeah. wicked. Within weeks... It was roadblocked. Yeah. And what I liked about it, um, it was my first um, big West End club, which was a, a little bit more racially mixed than 100 Club. 100 Club, Bluesville House of Funk on a Thursday night was almost exclusively black. Right. But just across the road, you know, um, there were white trendsetters there because a couple of kids who were white mates of mine who were in the year above me at school, I don't see them, they go off, they leave. Suddenly I see them in Crackle on a Tuesday. I'm like, wow, <laughs> this is big. And we lived in there. And, and again, um, the DJ at the time, Mark Roman, it was great, but um, his taste kind of grated on me a little bit. Okay. Um, and I guess that kind of helped hasten his departure. Because I remember when George played, when George came. George this is George Power. George Power. Of course. Yeah, didn't really have a clue, but within weeks. He knew he, where he, it was he, at. He knew where it was at, yeah. And it was swinging for years. And years. So can you remember your first gig? Um, my first gig would have been at my cousin's birthday party when I was about eight. My cousin Anne. As far back then? Yeah, as far back then. Um, okay, let's yeah. go forward to the professional gig then. <laughs> professional gig. Um, well, it depends, because I did many gigs for many years without being paid. Right. Um, uh, and one of my earliest professional club gigs would have been with George Power, actually, in 1970, Christmas 79, a little a famous piano bar opposite Eden Broadway Tube. Um, it's still there. It's featured in a recent heritage program on the on the news to stop developers knocking it down because it's a famous old jazz club, piano bar. Right. But anyway, Christmas 1979, 
George Power's book to play there. I can't believe it. The great George Power playing right on my doorstep. And so I asked the management of the club if I could do the warm-up for him or even play after. And at that time, I really had to swallow my pride because certain things had happened up till then. And I thought, you know what? I'm never going to ask anybody to warm up. I'm never going to beg anybody for a gig. Right. I'm going to run my own thing. I was fiercely independent and I was fearful of being knocked back because I'd been knocked back by another big white DJ a few years before and I asked to play. And I realized that was never going to happen and I thought, I'm never going to ask again. anybody again. Never put myself in that position again. Yeah.